Over the last few years, more and more modern technologies have been utilized by individuals with access to them in an effort to not only expose the truth regarding the real history of man, but to discover the actual original size of these now lost civilizations' ancient ruins. Many sites have been laid to waste, not only by future settlements and tomb robbers, but by Mother Nature herself, many of these most impressive sites having endured eons of erosion after being mysteriously abandoned, exposed to the elements. Yet there exists a number of these sites, which have been somewhat protected from these forces. Although vegetation can have a catastrophic effect, uprooting the megalithic foundations of these sites, yet the actual footprint of these structures, and indeed the overall size of these once lost settlements, can still be seen through modern penetrative radar, with one of the most incredible found in the past few years. Undoubtedly, the mega metropolis, hidden beneath the dense forests of Guatemala. Although some clearings dotted within this landscape have been spared, somehow avoiding the suffocation of trees, it has been discovered that these sites, long argued as separate sites of habitation, were, in reality, once part of the same gigantic city, one of unimaginable size and complexity that was unquestionably home to not mere thousands, but was in fact a settlement that was home to more than 10 million. Yet although this reality is a compelling, supportive fact regarding our own beliefs, in regards to a far greater, now hidden, and widely ignored history of mankind, there are still features of this ancient site that is still attempted to be ignored, overlooked, and hopefully concealed from the majority of the world's population, ultimately avoiding them questioning the true reality of what they have been taught, and the possible truth regarding our history, which these sites could provide to all those who gaze upon them. Although these particular megalithic blocks somehow stood on their heads, have been explored and exposed for nearly a hundred years with many photographic expeditions having been made to these sites, it has now been proven that these megalithic blocks were not merely signposts made of stones in situ, but were clearly stones cut and once transported to their current location, and were actually strategically placed within one huge mega-settlement. This fact is attempted to be stifled, avoiding individuals questioning how, if indeed they were transported and cut by our more recent ancestors, the Mayans, how they actually accomplished this feat, when they clearly required now lost techniques and technologies, as although they were far more primitive, technologically speaking to the modern man, with us only accomplishing such abilities within the last century, all thanks to modern technology. This is clearly an identifying feature, which exposes the true capabilities of the builders of this enormous city, and the fact that although academics would like to argue that it was merely a Mayan settlement, it possesses, like so many other astonishing sights on Earth, as yet unexplained enigmas, which not only fly in the face of this explanation for their origins, but actually suggest that they were merely re-inhabited by the Mayans, allowing archaeologists to point the finger at such a group due to their archaeological fingerprint having been left at the location. Sites which were in fact built by a now lost, yet once highly capable ancient civilization, that due to their immense age has now been lost to history, like so many of their ancient settlements, lost to the sands of time, with only the foundation of which now survive, thankfully exposed by modern technologies. Who were these ancient people? How or indeed why did they move and cut such enormous, enigmatic ancient megaliths within this enormous, now lost city? It is a place which we find highly compelling. Who built the Boro Bodor? One of the largest yet most infrequently academically shared Buddhist monuments in the world. Supposedly built within the 8th century AD, it ranks as one of the greatest archaeological sites of Asia, if not the world. We have on many occasions covered seemingly unexplainable, enormous ancient monuments and ruins, 
that we feel are attributed to a more modern inhabitant, who, according to the same academic study, were undoubtedly severely lacking the capability to complete such builds. In other words, we believe that due to the inexplicable nature of their construction, and indeed often the scale of the stonework involved in these sites, they were instead seen as an advantageous place to re-inhabit. In doing so, these piggyback cultures created their own illusions of power. Obviously, claiming they built such awe-inspiring, intimidating structures would have immediately put any native adversary or any invading party on the back foot. A daunting task for any of our ancestors, merely armed with swords and catapults to have invaded. Sites such as the Great Pyramids, Sacsayhuaman, Kulap, or any other incredibly well-constructed ancient fortress or structure would have provided a superior level of security, a ready-built sanctuary, allowing their people to flourish and, in turn, giving our modern academia a culprit to pin the constructions to. Additionally, the religious idols, the artistically illustrated belief systems, and any leftover technologies would have been adopted by these people. Thus, we strongly suspect that religions such as Buddhism was in fact left to us by a highly advanced lost civilization, translated and embraced by our more modern ancestors. This adaptation of belief systems has conveniently allowed the furthering of the agenda of academia, yet the structure's inexplicable features are merely ignored by this group rather than ever explained, this due to them simply incapable of explaining such constructions. This long list of worldwide unexplained anomalies, which grows in depth every day, is one of the main reasons why most of our taught history, we feel, is now obviously a lie. In truth, no one actually knows who built Baro Bador. They do not know when Baro Bador was built. And most important of all, they have no clue how it was built. The unexplained features within Baro Bador are greater in number than almost any other ancient site on Earth, and we suspect this to be the reason why it is rarely shared publicly. Yet, its past importance has not been overlooked by the modern world. Baro Bador, since knowledge of his existence was sparked in 1814, by Sir Thomas Ramford Raffles, then the British ruler of Java, who was informed of his existence and location by native Indonesians. Furthermore, speculation about an ancient lake which once surrounded Baro Bador was the subject of intense debate during the 20th century. In 1931, a Dutch artist and scholar of Hindu and Buddhist architecture, W. O. J. Nieuwenkamp, developed a hypothesis that the Kedu Plain which surrounds the pyramidal structure, was once a lake, with Borobador created to appear as a lotus flower floating on the water. We strongly believe that Borobador, along with its curious architecture, is one of the most enigmatic, as yet unexplained, ancient site on Earth. And as such, highly compelling. New Caledonia, a French territory in the South Pacific, comprising dozens of islands, it is best known for its palm-lined beaches and life-rich lagoon, which at 24,000 square kilometers is among the world's largest. Yet what many who investigate and visit the islands are unaware of is the enigmatic mystery of the tumulus. Found particularly upon the Isle of Pines, with over 400 of the structures found upon this one small island. Once argued as merely natural formations via volcanic activity, this hypothesis, however, has since been disproven, and their artificial origins have been confirmed. Yet this is not the most peculiar fact to surface surrounding these mounds. Intriguingly, it is a very little, if at all, photograph set of artifacts, a series of small man-made cement cylinders each measuring around 40 to 100 inches in height and between 40 and 75 inches in diameter, they are the oldest cement artifacts officially discovered anywhere on Earth. Made from a very hard, homogeneous lime mortar containing bits of seashell 
which garnered carbon dates of around 10,000 BC, putting their earliest official creation at around 3,000 years, before man was even supposed to have reached the Pacific from Indonesia. It is no surprise, then, that many now try to claim that the cylinders never existed, and instead, a mistake was made in regard to the actual basis of the tumuli, which have since been also revealed to have once been created using ancient concrete. However, this claim of convolution does not explain how we have many independent references to the cylinders found in a number of books and other articles of media dating to and just after their initial discovery. Also, the measurement of scale, which is clearly far too small to be attributed to the measuring of the mound's inner chambers. Furthermore, due to the controversy and impossibility to explain them using the already established chronology in regard to the migration of man, we have motive for many individuals to simply disappear the artifacts and in their place create a conspiracy to attempt to discredit their existence in the first place. Were these concrete cylinders buried in the tumuli for some reason? We still do not truly understand the function of these mounds, yet could they have protected these artifacts for untold millennia? Perhaps also from a great flood? We find such possibilities highly compelling. Danhol, yet pronounced Danehol after the Danes, Intriguingly, their purpose, although almost exclusively cut into chalk strata, is completely unknown, and although claimed to have been created by an invading party, were solely created within Kent and South Essex, consisting of a small vertical entry tunnel, which then opened into what could be described as spacious multi-room living quarters, with the largest inner chambers measuring some 18 feet wide and some set at a depth of over 80 feet, particularly those found in Hangman's Wood, Essex, which, interestingly, is now known as a site of special biological importance. These unusual chambers have baffled all who have investigated them. Undeniably dating prior to the documentation of history in England, cut into an unusually hard variety of chalk, all of which showing no deer horn, metal or flint tool marks, or any of the stone cutting, and many individuals who have investigated the inner chambers have concluded that the Dane holes must have been cut into individual cube blocks and then somehow extracted from the chambers. How this was achieved, however, is yet another mystery. Thankfully, due to Hangman's Wood being a preserved area, more than 50 Dane holes still exist within the three hectare site. What were the Dane holes used for? Who could have built them? Were they, like a number of other underground chambers we have covered in the past, found the world over, once built to be lived in, clearly attempting to shield oneself from an exterior threat? If so, why? Were ancient peoples in the UK also attempting to hide from something? An initial investigation of the Dane holes was undertaken in the 1800s, with almost nothing regarding the investigation into their origins having been undertaken since, although, fortunately, they are now receiving independently funded attention, the results of which will be available soon. We will, of course, keep you posted. Who dug the Dane holes? What were they used for? We find said questions highly compelling.